Over my career, I've done a lot of interviews with some well-known people and some people no one's heard about before. I thought it might be fun to drag some of them out of the archives and share them here on YouTube. And one of the most energetic people I ever ran into in radio is Rich Gilgallon. Rich worked on Capitol Hill in Washington, spent a lot of time there doing sports radio, and now doing radio commentary and talk in California. But even though he's a big city guy, he tells me he didn't really grow up in the big, big city. The uh, beautiful uh, coal mining city of Scranton, Pennsylvania. My father was a, uh, oh, well, my grandfather, my father's father was a, a breaker boy. Uh, he was in the mines when he was nine years wow. old. As you know, Dennis, they, they, uh, the coal carts that would go down into the mines, they would fill them up to the top, in, in fact, pile them up. And when they would come back up the track, they would, uh, you know, the, uh, many of the pieces would fall off the coal wagon and they would fall between the tracks. And a man's hand could not fit uh, between those tracks. So they hired nine-year-old, ten-year-old kids. Hoping that a car wouldn't come by. Oftentimes it did, Dennis, yeah. sadly. Uh, in fact, I, I've done a lot of research on what it was like in those days. And if you go back and look, you'll see that uh, every day somebody died in the coal mines in Scranton, Pennsylvania. So he did that from the time he was nine until he was 59. And my father was a computer engineer in the 50s. Wow. Uh, he was one of the first guys, uh, really, that was that would be called a computer engineer. His first job uh, where he took the family was to, uh, he worked for National Cash Register, and they actually put the first computer into Macy's in New York City, in Manhattan, and that was his, that was his job there for, for some time. So we moved to New Jersey after Scranton. Well, you know, National Cash Register, with I think with IBM, were probably two of the really innovative early companies. Well, they were the two. And I remember they had then no carbon required paper, which was also NCR, yeah. if, if you remember that. Well, they no, were. They were the two big ones in those days. Uh, the National Cash Register was uh, centered out of uh, uh, Dayton, Ohio, and uh, so we spent a little time there. And, you know, it was it was an amazing uh, uh, time growing up in in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, where I learned how to talk. Then, yes, yeah, I was going to ask about that. First grade through uh, through sixth grade, went, true, went to, <laughs> to New Jersey schools, and then we moved to Boston. Did I didn't ask you about that? No, you didn't ask me, but I felt like I should tell you anyway. <laughs> then we moved to Boston when I was uh, twelve, and that's I was there uh, until uh, I went to Washington in 1980. Getting back to mining for a second, I am from a part of Indiana where there was a lot of coal mining. As a matter of fact, there's a wonderful story. They didn't know there was coal under my hometown until they put the B&O Railroad through, and they had to cut a V through a hill to keep the railroad level, because unlike a highway where you can go up and down, mm -hmm. trains have to stay very, very on a constant sure. rate. They found coal digging for the railroad. That's amazing. But... You read about that, and you see those documentaries, and you think, I mean, coal was as necessary then as oil is now. Well, it's, my it's, God, it's actually you didn't that necessary. Know were, it's actually that necessary now. You didn't know if you were coming up that night. Right. Well, you, you know, know, it's interesting. Uh, you would drive uh, downtown T Scranton from where I lived on the west side, and you'd go by an eight-story building. And uh, when you came back, it was a six-story building. Because of subsidence? Yes, they would, uh, the ground would open up uh, every now and then, and, and buildings would just uh, disappear. But I grew up in a time where we lined our Little League field with coal ash. It was my job uh, to get up in the morning and, and stoke the fire. I'm, I'm not uh, uh, young. Uh, 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 you know, I remember very vividly uh, getting up at 5 in the morning, going down to put coal on the fire and, mm -hmm. and to empty the ash uh, cans, you know, so... Well, you say the word coal shoot to somebody today, yeah, they don't and know not everybody's shoot. going to know what the heck you're well, talking And the coal about. train, you know, when the, the, the coal train operator would blow the whistle as he approached the city limits of Scranton. And the reason they blew that whistle was so that the women uh, could go out and pull the uh, laundry off the, uh, off the line so that it wouldn't get all sooted up as the train went by. So they gave him fair warning to go out and get pull the clothes off the clothesline. I often wondered in steel mill cities such as was Allentown, a steel Allentown and, Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh, primarily, during the war when they were operating seven days a week, how the women ever hung their clothes outside. Well, yeah, they did anyhow. You yeah. know, but uh, 
you know, you just it was just one of the things they had to get used to in those days. We're pretty spoiled these days with everybody has a, a, a washer and a dryer in the house. Now, you, you say you, you grew up there, Scranton, mm-hmm. and then you, you moved, be, and then again you ended up in Boston. Ended up outside of Boston in Framingham, Massachusetts. How old were you then? I was uh, 12, uh, you know, when I got there in 66, uh, and then we... Uh, you know, my father worked for uh, Honeywell and, and uh, some of those other computer companies up there. So I went to high school there, was lucky enough to uh, be the uh, elected senior class president. And then uh, in 1973, the first year that uh, you could vote, actually 1972, the first year you could vote as an 18-year-old, mm-hmm. I ran for uh, local office uh, as a park commissioner of the town of Framingham against two guys that had been in there for about 15 years, 20 years, and, uh, and beat them. Really? Uh, door to door. As you an weren't 18 very 18 year old. I was 18. Yes, okay. I went to the town clerk's office. His name was Mike Ward. I'll tell you how long ago it was, he was smoking a cigar inside the office, which um, I know you would have loved. Yeah, a new broom sweeps clean. And he says, yeah. uh, I said, hey, uh, if you can vote at 18, can you run for something? He says, well, yeah, I don't see why not. What do you want to run for? I go, I don't know what he got. <laughs> so he laid out all the uh, all the uh, offices that were electable, and uh, there was one called Park Commissioner, and I, th- I thought I'd take a chance at that, and because I was very much into politics like you, and uh, amazingly, uh, I was elected. My mother said, "Now don't get your hopes up." That was my mother, you know. Don't get your hopes up. This is you're asking too much, and you know we did it the right way. I, I grew up. My grandmother was a uh, was the uh, Democratic. Uh, chairwoman for Lackawanna County in Pennsylvania, so I was familiar with election days. I, I was familiar with uh, campaign organization as, at a very, very young age. I worked for uh, guys that were running for governor when I was 14. You know, I, I marched in a parade with uh, Mike Dukakis, I think, when I was 14. I worked for Kevin White, you know, all the liberals up there when I was a kid. So, And then uh, one thing led to another. I was working in the Framingham incinerator, a garbage dump. <laughs> And uh, wound up uh, Father Drynan, I Robert, know you, you remember. The congressman, eventually. The, yeah, yeah. the Jesuit uh, congressman was uh, told by the Pope that he had to leave Congress. He couldn't no longer serve in Congress as a, as a Jesuit priest. And, and so uh, he retired, and about 20 people ran for that seat. And a friend of mine was a friend of a guy who happened to be running, and so I helped that guy. And. He wound up getting elected, and uh, it was uh, I was a uh, uh, Friday in the Framingham Incinerator and Monday in the halls of Congress. Wow! And that was Barney Frank, of course. Wow! So. Ab- absolutely. So, w- did you then stay in Washington? I did. Yeah, I, that's I, that's what brought you to D.C. Yeah, it brought me to D.C. I, I left the incinerator, packed and up, went into another one, and went into <laughs> where real garbage was stirred. <laughs> and uh, initially, I went down as a uh, an LBJ intern. Uh, and uh, I split that with uh, a guy named uh, Will Brownsberger, who was a Harvard uh, lawyer. So it was a Harvard lawyer and an incinerator attendant uh, that uh, split the uh, LBJ uh, intern grant. I remember the first time I sat in on a Commerce Committee hearing. I'm looking around, and I can't remember all the names now, but I'm seeing all of these congressmen I'd seen on television and heard about and I was kind of a groupie. I mean, I was really in awe of a legislative uh, process. But the other thing is how much time it takes to get anything done. Oh, yeah. You would sit in a congressional hearing and have to leave and make a car payment. I yeah. mean, it was really deadly. Something. I was just going to say, particularly in the House, yeah. uh, where you have 435 members. And if you're at, in the Commerce uh, uh, Committee uh, uh, meeting... There's probably what sixty members of that. Of that yeah, there committee. were two tiers of yeah. chairs. And so, yeah. I mean, the work gets done primarily in the House in subcommittees, mm-hmm. where you have like twelve or thirteen. It's a little more manageable. The committee work is generally just to to process what takes place in the subcommittees. So, after a while on Capitol Hill, you're among all these movers and shakers, but it just doesn't feel right. You go into private business, I into do. the restaurant. I business. do. Yeah, I was proud to be a bartender. In but fact, it's not an easy job. No, I was. I think I was one of the best bartenders in uh, Washington D.C. I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill, and then I wound up going up to Northwest Washington to Chadwick's, which was the uh, bar that just happened to be located, uh, you know, in the middle of Media Central, where uh, all the TV and radio stations would gather. 
And it was just a stroke of luck, really, that I just happened to be there. And I got sober around that time. Uh, around 1985 in April, I I, I, uh, I quit drinking and... But how can you be a bartender and quit drinking? Well, you know, I, I found it, you know, I found it easier to look out uh, rather than looking in. Okay. Uh, I, I, you know, nobody thought I was going to quit. I mean, I was not a, a light case, and uh, I had a little Oriole calendar by the cash register, and every day I came in and took a magic marker and crossed off one day. You know, and then before you knew it, it was. Uh, you know, the end of the season, and then before you knew it, it was a year, and then it was 10 years. And so it was, it was a lot of years. one days at a time. It was a lot of one days at a time. So uh, that cleared my head up uh, a lot. And, uh, you know, and I, just f- from working in the restaurant business, just happened to be attending bar one day when the general manager, Frank Byrne from WMZQ, was a, a customer. And I just overheard him uh, tell Jim London, who was the famous morning guy, Jim London and Mary Ball, an amazing uh, uh, country music team in Washington, D.C., just happened to overhear him say that the guy that was doing their Redskin reports, Jeff Bostick, had signed a deal with WMAL to switch stations. And I don't to this day, Dennis, know what possessed me. I only can say it was God. I leaned over that bar and, and I said to him, Frank, I could do that job. And he said, Rich, uh, this is uh, not uh, Scranton. This is the number six market in the country. Uh, give us two menus and two Heinekens and then leave us alone. We're talking business. There's the, there's the brush up. Sure. And I just went back and I said, Frank, I'm not at your, in your office. You're in my office. In fact, you're sitting at my desk. This is 1987, 86. I said, nobody in the country has a fan's perspective. This is before ESPN. There was no sports radio. I said, you could be the first station in the country with a fan's perspective, and what better fan than a bartender? And I'm the best bartender in town, and uh, what, 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 what can I get you guys for lunch? About a couple of days later, this guy called me back. Were He's, you surprised? I was shocked. I would think so. He said, Rich, I haven't slept in two nights since you talked to me. Come in and make a tape. We'll see what it sounds like. So I went in and made a tape with Jim London and Mary Ball. It was a great uh, audition tape. And uh, he, he called me that day and he said, it sounds pretty good. I have to take it to Sumner Redstone. And, and it, nobody's ever done this. Now, he was owner? Oh, Sumner was the owner of MZQ. Yeah. He owned Viacom. Now, at this point, you, you mentioned, I don't want to lose people if they're not from D.C., you mentioned that Jeff Bostic had gone to WMAL, yeah. which, for, as sports at that time, they had the Redskins. Yeah, they, they carried pretty the much the radio Absolutely. station. Absolutely, that's why he went. Sure. And MZQ then was what? About Just the country station. And about fourth in the market? Uh, I, you know, it was top ten, okay. uh, always top ten. Now, uh, you know, it was, it, should, it, it was a very good station, yeah. but not at the top. No, not at the top. Yeah. Although, but a potent FM signal. Very big FM yeah. signal, 98.6 mm-hmm. uh, FM. And uh, make a long story short, uh, you know, he called me uh, after speaking to Sumner, and they decided to put me on Friday mornings and Monday mornings, previewing the week, the weekend. And, and then, then Monday, wrapping, morning, Monday morning, morning wrapping yeah. up, 6.45 and 7.45, two three-minute segments. And I'll give you 300 bucks cash. And I thought I died and went right to heaven. Because I had to work hard to make 300 bucks, Dennis. Yeah. As a bartender. That's three nights schlepping, you know. Averaged about 100 a night, maybe behind the bar. I had a friend who was a bartender in D.C. He said, you would think with all the wealth in this town, the tips would be higher. No. But they're not. Well, you know, it's tough. It's tough. You know, bartender, people say, I'd like to be a bartender. I tell them, okay. Stand at your desk all day today. Don't do anything different. Do what you normally do at work, but do not sit down, not for a second, for your nine hours on the job. And then if you can do that a couple days in a row, then maybe you'll have a chance. But, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it, it was, uh, I was, I, I couldn't believe it. Now, the amazing thing is that three days later, Frank Byrne, who was the general manager of MZQ, was let go. And I have never seen or spoken to him again. (laughs) So he gets you in the door, and then he's out. He's gone. (laughs) And I, I, you know, I didn't know any of the politics of the building at that time. So for seven years, I closed Chadwick's at three in the morning on Thursday night and Sunday night, 
And then I drove to the studio at MZQ on Cleveland Circle there at, uh, uh, you know, at like 3.35. It took a, a two-hour nap in the, on the couch in the jock lounge where you, in those days everybody was smoking in the jock lounge. Yeah. And uh, I wake up, uh, take a big cup of coffee and do uh, my segments. And then one day I said to MZQ, we had a different manager obviously at the time, I said, you know, I've been doing this a long time for this 300. Do you think I can get another couple of hundred? And the guy said to me, it's not in the budget. I said, okay. Seven years. Well, that day I get a call from a guy named Scott Meyer, who was in Washington, D.C. at the behest of the Rails brothers that own uh, 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 half a Sears and Craftsman Tools. And they wanted to buy, they were going to buy, uh, they bought an AM uh, a station that was simulcasting classic music, and we're going to put the first sports station in Washington, D.C. He said, I heard your stuff this morning, and I want, to, I want you to come down to the Occidental Hotel. Now, I got to work that night, Chadwick's. It's like a Friday. I said, all right. So I get a cab, I, I don't, and I take it to the Occidental. I got my Chadwick's tie on. And he says to me, I heard you this morning. I have an idea. I want you to be our afternoon drive uh, uh, talk show host on a new sports station in Washington, D.C., and I'll give you $60,000. Oh, this would have been what year? 1992. Uh, At that point, there, there were some sports stations around the country. There were two. But there were two. I was going to say, less than half a yeah, dozen. Yeah, there was one in San Diego, uh, and, and, uh, and there was obviously the fan in New York. And that was the only two sports stations in the country. And so this guy, in fact, uh, is the guy that put together the fan in New York. And so he said, uh, I said, make it 80. <laughs> he said, I'll give you 60. I said, make it 80. I didn't know. I, I thought that's what you were supposed to do, you know. It's a digger. He said, I'll give you 70 and don't push it. I said, okay. <laughs> and I, I never made 30, you know. So uh, I went back to MCQ and I said, you know, these guys don't even know me. Uh, they don't know, you know, how I am in the office or whatnot. They offered me 70 and they said, well, we'll match it. And I said, no, I think we'll let it go. And so he, this guy was going to be the general manager, Scott Meyer. Well, he had a falling out with the Rails brothers, apparently. And so he was not going, he wound up not being the general manager. And so I never saw him or spoke to him again after I signed a, a deal. You have this thing about people you sign contracts with. I know people you? say that. <laughs> it really, I look upon it as as miracles as agents uh, uh, angels yes. uh, you know uh, there are people that you'll come across it could happen today where you'll just bump into somebody and they'll say something and, and the next thing you know the course of your life has changed forever the, the first job i got in dc i i will say this i used to visit all the time because they had aunts and uncles out there and they were pretty well off and i didn't find out till after my dad died that my uncle Austin, who was assistant head of the General Services Administration or something, had lived out there since the Depression. He was sending money back for my dad for gasoline and motel and everything to make it possible for his brother to come visit. Well, anyway, I had a friend at Associated Press Radio whom I had taught how to operate the control board when he was a student at the university in the town where I was working. And I went to visit AP Radio one night, and I'm getting ready to leave, and this guy rushes in, and just shouting profanities, and finally they said, Howard, what's wrong? And he said, our, our overnight anchor, his parents were killed in a car wreck, he gave us three days notice. And I turned to the guy, I said, what do you have to do? He said, well, you have to read for six hours and be fairly literate and be able to hit the clock. And well, right up your time. alley, Dennis. And I said, well... Should I put, he said, well, here, tomorrow, you, you leave, yeah, I'm driving back to Indiana. We'll stop and, and leave a tape. So I stopped by the station, which was on the way out of town. And I, I walk in and I explain that this man, Howard Dykus, had said this. And the guy just goes over to the teletype and rips off a piece of paper, says, go in the room. I'm going to roll tape. You read it. It was about changes in the curia of the Catholic Church with all kinds of names that I could read with my eyes closed. I was really up to date on that. So I read it. Of course, back then, I'm talking like this. You sure. know, we all had that rock and roll. Well, you, you know, you have a, an amazing uh, broadcast uh, presence. Dennis. Well, thank you. So, and I don't look like I sound, but neither one of us does. So anyway, I drive back to Indiana, and the phone rings. The guy said, when can you come to work? I did not have the guts to tell my dad how little he was offering me. 
But I came to D.C. and I got I would not have gotten that job if I had left five minutes earlier. It's amazing. Thing. I would probably never move there. Yeah, that's you an know? amazing thing, isn't it? It really people is. People have bad luck. People have good luck. But everyone I know in broadcasting got one or two jobs in the most incredibly haphazard way. Oh, absolutely. It's it's like you overhearing the guy at the bar. Yeah, it's not it's not what you know. Uh, the, he, Frank Byrne said to me, do you have an education in, in uh, broadcast? Journalism, I said no. <laughs> he said, "Do you have any experience?" So no, I, I said, "Well, no. You know, no, I was, uh, you know, I mean, I've been in politics. I mean, I know how to talk, you yeah. know." And I, I, you know, something I just knew uh, there was. I had a sense that I would be really, really good at this. Uh, and and uh, you know, I, I think I probably think I'm better than a lot of ex bosses think I am. But you know, it, it, as you know, to survive in broadcasting for almost 30 years uh, you got to have a thick skin and you got to be prepared to go where wherever you have to go to follow the dream so i remember being in a conversation sometime with someone about how the old phrase what goes around comes around when i was at indiana university there were two guys who were thrown together in all kinds of projects who could not stand each other and one of them was a very large guy. I'm not going to mention any names. But on the final day in senior year, we did live television newscasts. The other guy back in the control room put a crawl. Those are those words you see across the bottom. I'll call him Mr. The, the large guy, Mr. Tubb. Mr. Tubb's wardrobe by Bloomington Tent and Awning. Oh, killer. Okay? Right. Fifteen years later, the guy who put the crawl gets a job with KCBS in San Francisco and walks in and finds out that Mr. Tubbs is his boss. You never know. <laughs> you, yeah, never burn yeah, any bridges. Try not to burn bridges. It's not easy. Uh, in a, in a, in a uh, radio is extraordinarily uh, confrontational inside the buildings. Uh, you know, it's uh, almost shamefully. So. Sometimes I think so. Yeah, yeah. it's it's uh, you know it's. For example, if you're any good in a reasonably sized market, uh, you're going to make more money than your program director or your boss. Mm -hmm. And that sets up a very strange uh, dynamic. Yes. You know, when when when, uh, a guy who is in charge is making less money than the guy who he's in charge of. It's a very strange situation. You don't find it uh, in very many uh, other businesses. Yeah. When I was at Mutual Broadcasting, I was a non-union director producer. Back then, they would not let me touch a tape recorder. Right. The National Association of Broadcast Engineers and Technicians, engineers, did that. Mm-hmm. And if I did it, they'd file a grievance. Mm-hmm. They were making, back then, about 31 an hour mm-hmm. under some circumstances. And I think I was making $12 or something. And you're right. There were times I had to lower the boom on these guys, and I felt like, where am I coming from? I'm just a peon here at the company. But it, it can create some really odd tensions between people. And, and, you know, ego, of course, this is an ego-driven, radio is an ego-driven business, obviously. We have gone through his career and his amazing accidental leap into broadcasting Mm -hmm. in D.C. How many years were you with that Pioneer All Sports Station? Uh, We uh, got hired by WTM in uh, TEM. I got hired in February of uh, 92. And the strange thing was, after this meeting with Scott Meyer, uh, I went back to MZQ to inform them that, you know. This was was the station station where you had been working. Yeah. Yeah. For eight years. And, and as I said, for seven years, seven. I told them that I was, these guys offered me 70 grand without even knowing who I was. And, and they're paying you $300 a yeah, week. Yeah, 300 right? a week. And they offered to match it, uh, which I, I turned them down. And so I told uh, Scott Meyer that. And so they started paying me right away, which was an amazing blessing because we didn't go on the air till Memorial Day in May. Uh, and we went on the air. Uh, I, I went on the air with an g- unbelievable sports talk show uh, called Kylie and the Coach. Uh, my partner was Kevin Kylie, the who, Kevin Kylie, who, from, who was the, he was the sports guy in D.C. on, yes. on Channel Seven. He was also on uh, 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 Turner football coverage, did ESPN college football games. Very well known uh, guy in the sports business. And now, what what what, what hours? Were your show? Well, you know, the, the lineup at WTEM was amazing. It started out with Paul Harris, who went on to KMOX in uh, St. Louis, the, the long... 
and worked uh, with Jack outst- Buck there yeah, for a outstanding long, long career. time. Uh, and then we had uh, Tony Kornheiser, who's still there, by the way. Now, is he essentially a newspaper writer? He was, he un- was until okay. we started on the radio. In fact, Tony and I had done a demo for WMAL maybe a year before uh, we we were both hired by WTEM. So once he got the radio bug, bye bye newspaper. No, no, he still wrote for the Post for a long time. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, but he he has since I think probably given that up uh, because he was the. I mean, he went on to do Monday Night Football, yep. which is the the plum of all plums in our business. So uh, we uh, we had James Brown, uh, eloquent, wonderful human being from uh, CBS Television. He was uh, on from noon to two, and then Kylie and the coach from two to six. So it was uh, it was a great lineup, and I n- never thought it would end. You know, I well, thought see, it'd be good. you yeah. had that afternoon drive, yeah. people going home, yeah. listening to you in the car, and I was a whack job. I was like the number one Washington Redskin fan in the country, and I didn't <laughs> care who knew about it. I had a sound effect every time the Dallas Cowboy fans would call. It would be like. Ding, ding, <laughs> spittoon. I had a great time. Kylie and I disagreed on almost everything. We uh, we argued pretty much straight for four hours a day, but we developed an amazing passion uh, for the business and a love for each other that that I think people saw through. And we actually, after we had left WTEM and went our separate ways, we were called by uh, ESPN to do a week when Dan Patrick went on vacation just a few years ago. So we had a little reunion week, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was a great show. Uh, unfortunately, uh, w- the uh, station decided to syndicate us, and there had never been a sports syndicated station ever. And so they got a, they hooked a deal up with Jones uh, Inner Cable in Denver, and, and they started to syndicate us. In fact, we were on probably 120 stations, and one of those stations uh, was out here in the Coachella Valley. So... Uh, you know, the guys that were working there were a little miffed that uh, they signed a contract to work for one station. Right. And so uh, they wanted to renegotiate all the deals. Now, I, on the other hand, had never made this kind of dough, you know. No, you were thrilled. I was like, I this, begged them, this please trouble. don't gum this up. Please, I'm begging you guys, listen, don't mess this up. This well, beat shoveling ashes yes. like crazy. So they messed it up. And, uh... Uh, the station, uh, my recollection of it was that they contacted Jones and asked them to help pay the salaries, and they said no. And so they said, okay, then syndicate this, and they fired everybody. Uh, wow. It was a disaster. What did it feel like to be part of a brand-new radio station that hadn't gone on the air yet, mm-hmm. to be there and give birth to it? Well, it was really exciting, Dennis. I mean, uh, I had done a vignettes for seven years. I mean, I had done editorials, written and read. Uh, this was a new challenge. This was straight talk, you know. And so, uh, I uh, it, it initially, I, I was probably a little uh, green, uh, you know. Uh, so I had to f- work my way through that conversational uh, stuff, and, and I just decided that we we were overmanaged. Is that a surprise? No, not at all. <laughs> you know, uh, I had program directors telling me, no, you got to talk like this, you got to talk like that. And finally, I just said, you know what, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do, I got a contract now. You know, I mean, I've already signed a two year contract. So I'm going to do the way I want to do it. If I get fired for doing it the way I want to do it, I can live with that, Dennis. But if I try to conform to everything you are trying to make me be, and I get fired for that. I can't live with that. So, you know, I had I had problems with uh, the succession of of uh, program directors uh, that were there because they didn't get me. I, you know, I'm just a regular guy. That's I don't try to be anybody different. You know, uh, and they're not used to that. No, they're I not. I mean, so much of radio is facade. Yeah, ESPN. And there are so many people we know who are a completely different person off the air than they are, than on, they are on the air. Very, very true. And so e- don't have them change. That's what's making them the money. Right. ESPN never got me. I, I've, I've been through that building several times, uh, but they, you know, they. I did not fit their their little cookie cutter uh, image that they have. You can see when you watch it. Uh, you know, they're, they're, you have to be 
almost unfunny uh, to right. be accepted as a, as a member of that staff. All those years when I was in D.C., I constantly put in applications to go to NPR. Because I was doing, I was on the road every week, largely at my own expense, which is why I do not live in splendor now. But I kept getting these polite letters from NPR, and finally one of the people in hiring said, you know, you're just a little rock and roll for us. It's amazing. And I suddenly realized they wanted that kind of college, low-key thing, even out on the road. You well, know, see, that's the problem with our the business. Niagara Falls. You're absolutely right. That's, that's one of the problems with our business is program directors. Yeah. Uh, they have an ear for what they expect to hear. And, and if it, they don't hear it in four seconds, it, it kills they, them. they it, shut the tape right, off. It drives them crazy. And, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, a lot of great, uh, talented people, uh, you know, never got the chance. Well, you know, the great story about broadcasting, and, and I do a speech about the history of radio, is when CBS sent Murrow to Europe in advance of the war because UP and AP wouldn't sell news to radio. They thought it was an inferior medium, so they said, go set up a news bureau. Somebody files a report back to New York from Austria when uh, was, um, the, the, when the Anschluss happened, when, when their, Hitler's moving in. Mm-hmm. And it was this incredible on-the-scene report, and the head of CBS, Bill Paley, wires Murrow back, said, this guy doesn't sound like an announcer. Mm. And Murrow wired back something to the point that, do you want someone who sounds like an announcer or someone who knows what's going on? And Paley issued a a report that said, touche. That was Eric Severide in the beginning. And that's what what got radio news really kicking in those days. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting. I had the the, uh, occasion to get to know uh, Paley Jr. uh, in Washington, D.C. A very fascinating uh, family. You know, fascinating family. And really, uh, who knows where CBS would have been, you know, without him. For those who don't know, William Paley was essentially CBS. Mm -hmm. He was, you do it, you don't do it. If you saw that great movie, A Good Night or Good Luck, about Mm -hmm. Murrow, George uh, Langella, Frank, Frank Langella played, played Paley. But he allowed people such as Orson Welles to be on the air with no sponsor. He would allow people whom he thought was were creative, who had talent, and gave the kind of programming he thought CBS needed, whether he lost money on it. Or yeah, it wasn't all about the dough. No, in, and in those you days. talk about that today, people go, you're out of your mind. Yeah. No pay, no play. It's all about the dough today, brother. <laughs> what, what's, you know, what I teach uh, young people who want to get involved in radio is I, I try to have them to understand that... Much like uh, the the picture that you will get, that you will look at, that is a uh, uh, you know a little girl picking flowers, and if you stare at it long enough, you see the dragon. Mm-hmm. Uh, radio is similar in that what's important really is not what I do in the segments that I do it. What's important is the advertisement that comes in between my segments. In other words, the ads don't come in between my segments i come in between the segments of ads uh you know if you want to do private radio uh, for pay radio uh, then you got to have sponsors and if you're going to be a talent you're going to have to get actively involved and participate in not only the the finding of those sponsors but in the mollification of those sponsors. Keep them happy. Which is something i've always stressed. I had a friend who managed a radio station and he found out that the station, when it joined ABC Radio, signed on that it would carry all the sports casts on weekends and never carried any. And he said, I talked to CBS, and I said to them, well, okay, well, I'll find a place for these. And I, he said, well, it'll really add something to our programming. And the woman on the other end of the phone said, we're not concerned about content. We're concerned about getting the commercials. On. Well, well, that's yeah, that's why. Uh, and so it's that it's a whole it. different mindset. It he is. was thinking in terms of what it's going to do to make the station sound better, right. and all they wanted were their damn commercials on the air. Well, you see, that's that's philosophically, you know, I think I, I, I know a lot of great talent that failed in radio because they looked down their nose at the sales department. OK, uh, you have to work as a team, in my view, if you want to have a successful radio show. 
and you have to incorporate uh, those uh, those sponsors. That's the blessing of amplitude modulated radio, is that you have the opportunity to schmooze up a client outside of the commercial. Sure. You know, I mean, you can bring them on for a segment. You can have that conversation. It makes them feel very special. And, you know, you get a chance to say thank you uh, for spending your hard-earned money and promoting the show. And as you know, uh, especially in conservative talk radio today, there's a little bit of a a battle going on around the country from uh, organizations that have have been formed in order to get conservative talk off the air. And so uh, they they have little uh, cabals where people call sponsors and harass them for uh, advertising on the Rush Limbaugh show or the Rich Gil Gallant show or what have you. And. And so that's why you have to, especially today, you know, you, you know, it's not just a, it's not like it was in the old days where you go into a restaurant and say, you know, give me a hundred bucks and we'll talk about your restaurant. I mean, you have to have people that uh, that uh, want to stand with you, uh, you know, especially in talk. And radio. advertisers are much more sophisticated than they oh, used to be. Absolutely. But, but here again, they all like to hear their name on the air. Of course they do. As do I, Dennis. Oh, and so as do you. <laughs> now, is Rich Gogallon your real name? That's my actual birth name. Yes, it is. Because mine is Dennis Daly. And everybody says, well, what's your real name? I said, well, Dennis Daly, isn't that a radio name? I go, no. Well, there was a guy in Washington, D.C. I'm trying to remember his name. He worked for Viacom. Uh, it might have been Fuddrucker, let's just say. It was mm-hmm. Billy, Billy Fuddrucker. And they told him he couldn't go on the, the air with that name. And so he said, okay, and he went on with uh, as Marty Fuddrucker and, you know, really kind of bummed him out. Uh, I, I had a, a, a friend whose news director was Bernard Broomhead. And I said, what did he call himself funny. on the air? He said, Bernie Broomhead. Bernie Broomhead. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, we've had uh, Anita Mann. Uh, yeah. We, heard, we had her on the air for a while. and. You know, it's one of the interesting things about uh, radio. But, you know, it, it's it's such a theater of the mind, is the saying. In Washington, D.C., there were some great DJs and voices. Uh, LBD, and, uh, Wolfman Jack was there for a while towards the end of his career, and a bunch of other guys, Bob O'Brien. And I'm in, the, uh, I'm in a restaurant one day with a bunch of people, and a waiter comes up and he says... Uh, What will it be? I said, you know, I think I'll have the pot roast. And he said, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you're in our restaurant. We listen to you on the radio every single day. And so everybody at the table is paying attention, and my chest is puffing up a little bit. And I said, well, thank you. What I'm so happy to hear that. And he yells back, Jimmy, LBD is here. The wrong person. I said, oh. (laughs) I was in a restaurant in D.C. one time, and I have a loud voice. And this guy at the next booth, I never understood the decorations, but he had, he was military. He had scrambled eggs all over him, you know, and uh, epaulets or whatever they call him. And he said, are you Dennis Daly? And I said, yes, I am. He said, well, I listen to you on Armed Forces Radio. And at that time, I was doing overnights. I didn't always have prime time. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, you must be one of the five or six people who were up at that time. He said, no, no, no. I'm in Tokyo. Said you're doing the prime time news wow, over so there. you never know. And do I you? thought, wow, you know, maybe somebody's hearing it out there. You know, you mentioned he certainly and, was. And you mentioned NPR in Washington D.C. You know, they have the uh, uh, WAMU is the number one station in town. Yes, and, and, and that's American University. It's American yeah. University. It and plays, a mutual. F- go ahead. It plays bluegrass mm-hmm. primarily. You wouldn't and, think so. And gives, and gives you the you know the news of the day and with a couple of uh, NPR type shows on it. So well, a mutual. A friend or at least acquaintance of ours, Ed Walker, who did the was an announcer in, in D.C., born blind, mm-hmm. and for years had a partner at night, Willard Scott. That's they exactly did the right. Joy Boys. Well, Ed and I did a show one time, and we're talking about the theater of the mind, and he does this thing where he says, now I'm going to go over here and get these books, bring them back, yeah. and ruffling paper and everything, and then he has some cellophane, he <laughs> starts coughing as if it's on fire. And he didn't move out of his chair, but it sounded as if he walked across the room and came back. And that is the great thing about radio. Well, the great one. We are what people think we are. That's right. The greatest I ever saw, personally, was Doug Tract, uh, the grease man. Mm -hmm. He had, in those days, everything was on tracks, commercial, eight-track, you know. And you would have uh, a track machine, which would have, in in most stations, you'd have one that had three tracks. It's Mm -hmm. pretty much all you'd need. He had, like... 
five of those three-track machines piled on top of each other on both sides. And of each the, had a tape in them. Yeah and, yeah, and he would tell these amazing, convoluted, complex stories and be pushing and pulling and pushing and pulling and putting these eight tracks in there. And that was a skill. Some of those guys could play those machines as if they were typing. It's true. Know, or, or like the playing like an the organ. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. He was the best. He was the best I ever saw. Did you ever meet Nat Albright? Uh, I can't think. I, I, when I first went to D.C., there was this fellow, Nat Albright, who talked like this. He did recreated sports in the, in the, the uh, persona of what they did in the 30s, where the guy would sit there and he'd get the teletype, first inning, so-and-so right. up. Single. That's what uh, Ronald Reagan did. That's what Ronald Reagan did. But if you like tennis, you could go to uh, Nat and say, Nat, uh, my boss is named uh, Joe Betts, and I'd like for him to play Ely Nastasi. And he'd do a tape of this guy, of your football. Made a, a great amount of side money doing that. Well, you know, I, I uh, grew up listening to great talk radio in Boston. WBZ? WBZ, two five four five six seven eight. This is the Larry Glick Show. Larry Glick. We could Glick. do an hour yeah, on Larry Glick. Glick, who was an overnight Overnight, wacko. amazing talk radio. And I worked the third shift for years, and so... I really learned uh, an awful lot about about what it takes to be a, a, a radio personality from listening to Larry Glick and, and Guy Manila and uh, those great guys. And Kenny Beatrice, uh, you know, and i got to give him some credit, too, down there at WMAL, did sports talk before uh, anybody else did. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, uh, it's not heavy lifting, you know. But you have to enjoy it. When radio ceases to be fun... Get out. Oh, you know. You'll and know I'm right doing away. four hours a day now, and at my age, I don't think I want to do five or yeah. six. You know, four is fine, and you're doing two. I'm doing two, but I'd love to do four. Okay. But, but they won't give them to me, so Maybe I'll take work. my two. I have two quick questions. Yeah. Do older people call you Kill Gallon? Well, yes, they do because of Dorothy, uh, you know. And, uh, in fact, I've been, my name gets butchered. Gagolin, Gogolin, Gilligan, Galgolian, <laughs> Gilgalian. Gill, first name, Gallon, last name, you know. Uh, but they do. And, and uh, you know, my family's always uh, had a soft spot in our heart for Dorothy uh, Kill Gallon, who, frankly, I believe was, was uh, you know, tragically murdered by someone in our own government she to knew keep her quiet. Yeah. About something. She just came back. Yeah. She had just gotten back from interviewing uh, Ruby? Jack Ruby yeah. and, and had bragged uh, to several people that she was going to blow this story wide open. And she was found the next day in her bed sitting up uh, in her clothes and, and uh, uh, dead. And her all her papers and everything were gone, missing. So it was a wow. tragedy. Well, you know, she had a tie to radio in another way. Mm -hmm. Her husband, Dick Calmer was Boston Blackie from the radio from radio yeah and you know of course uh, doing all those TV shows and and stuff oh like sure that. And, and she was a, a fine journalist really a good writer I said that was going to be one or two of my final questions it, the, answer, answer me this those years you did sports in DC mm -hmm. am I wrong in saying that it was in a way the perfect sports town because you had people from everywhere there it was very cosmopolitan. Uh, you know, it wasn't the perfect sports town because at that time uh, they were still trying to find a baseball team. They had lost two. Uh, one went to Texas and the other went to uh, Minnesota. We had a bartender in Washington, D.C. named Baseball Bill who made it his life mission to get a baseball team back in Washington, D.C. In fact, when the guy uh, whose name escapes me in our conversation went to Minnesota, he ran for governor. And uh, Baseball Bill went to every bartender in Washington, D.C., me included, and we all chipped in, and we bought a full-page ad in the uh, uh, Minnesota Tribune or whatever and, and said, this guy is a liar. He said he would never leave, and he took the team you know, away. If, you, if you're going to want to vote for a liar, vote for him. And he wound up losing that election. I don't think that had everything to do with it, but, uh, you know, there was, uh, it, it's a great city. But so is the desert of Southern California for the same thing. What, that's one of the reasons why I never, uh, you know, even when I did a sports show here in a small market, I never focused on the local stories. I, I treated it like, uh, like it was a national show. You have a very high percentage of well-educated retirement age people here 
who have a little bit of money, as I say, good education, who are who speak well. And you're right. That that's when I listen to your show. Those people who are calling in are on the ball. Well, I, I treat it as a, if it's a national show. I mean, for several reasons. One, you never know. Maybe uh, somebody will hear it, and it'll be a national show, which is every small market uh, talk show host dream. And two, because the area is so cosmopolitan, uh, you know, we have people that. Uh, grew up in Minnesota, in Oregon, ca- Canada, you know, Mexico. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 I treat them, uh, I think if you treat your audience as intelligent, uh, you know, you'll have an intelligent audience. It's pretty much that simple. So, By the way, if you go to the ballpark at Arlington, Texas, there's an annex of the Cooperstown Museum there. Mm. And if you look at the uniforms of the Rangers... The first year, you can see stitching that says Senators. I'm sure, yeah. That's how cheap they were. (laughs) Bob Short. Bob Short was the guy's name. Uh, I believe it was Bob Short that ran for governor or something. And uh, Baseball Bill made it his mission on earth to to go get that guy. And... and, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I mean, that's a metropolitan uh, city. Yeah. You know, and it's so dominated by by politics. Uh, I was bar- I was town. I was bartender one night. You'll appreciate this story. And every producer and anchor and weatherman and is in my restaurant. And, and this is the day before cell phones when everybody had beepers. Well, beep beep, heard a beeper go off. Okay, beep beep, another one. Beep beep, beep beep. All 60 beepers went this up. This is like time. seeing cars in the Pentagon parking lot at night. You yeah. know something's up. So that was the night Marion Barry had his, uh, his uh, saddest night with the crack pipe. Yeah, the, the former D.C. mayor. So everybody left, and uh, you know I was stuck with 30 checks uh, sitting <laughs> on the bar until they cleared the story. So it was a great time. I loved that city. You never know. I, I really enjoyed it. I uh, you know, yeah, but you have a niche here in Palm Springs. I like it here. And what did it feel like the first day you came back on the air and the phones rang off the hook? Well, you know, I left uh, just about a year ago uh, to go back to Massachusetts. My uh, father was not in good health, and I, I had hoped to be more of a participating uh, family member in that regard. And then he uh, tragically passed away about eight hours before the plane landed. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, it got my trip back there off to a rocky start. It was very hard to find work. And uh, I just, uh, you know, at some point I decided, well, if I don't go back now, it, it, I'll never be able to go back. And so it was six or seven months, and I came back, and uh, I was lucky enough to secure a job again and and have a couple of different things going on. So, I But as, as I say, you came back on the air, your old niche in Palm Springs, and the the welcome you got on the air it's amazing, was really, was wasn't it? I'm it was so happy sweet. you said that. Yeah, it was amazing. Uh, you know, I, I think, and I've said this before, this is a situation in this particular market, Dennis, where an audience was searching for a show. I mean, it's not just because it's the great, uh, attractive. Uh, magnetic personality of Rich Gilgallon. I, I wish that it was. But really, you know, the audience was hunting for a show on a local level where people could express themselves about the, their frustration with the government. And Right, and the word is local. The odds yes. of getting through to Sean Hannity or, or Rush Limbaugh very on the difficult. phone and then being put on the air, you might as well buy a lottery ticket. Yeah, and, and I, I would say to people uh, who are listening, if they own a uh, medium to small market a radio station, don't, uh, you know, don't pipe in everything. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I know that you. I know it costs a little money to put yeah, somebody but on local the Local is what radio does best. And, and you know, no matter how in some right. cases small town it might seem, by gosh, it's their town. You're absolutely right. And and you know, obviously, radio stations are dealing with satellite radio and this and that. The one thing that they'll never be able to replace is local talk. And I, I, it's my feeling that at some point, uh, as the satellite market grows and it's been growing steadily uh, that at some point uh, local FM music stations won't make uh, that much sense and so I think that at some point uh, all local FM stations probably will be talk at some point because 
Uh, you can't replace that, you know, and, and sponsors will gravitate towards that, and listeners will always want to know what's going on locally. So, And you do it well. Thank you, sir, and it's a pleasure to work with you. Thank you, and thanks for being here. My pleasure. Anytime. Hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for going back into the archives with me. I'm Dennis Daly. See you next time right here on YouTube.